For purposes of teaching, it's customary to divide history, at least the history of the West, into certain very broad periods, such as ancient, medieval, and modern. And we do exactly the same thing with philosophy. We talk of ancient philosophy, medieval philosophy, and modern philosophy. And you'll find that most histories of philosophy are divided into those three sections. Ancient philosophy is dominated by the writings of two people, Plato and Aristotle. Of course, there were other important and interesting philosophers in the ancient world, not only before Plato and Aristotle, but also after them. But no one who has left writings of comparable quantity, caliber, and influence. If you went to a university to study ancient philosophy, you'd find yourself spending most of your time, and perhaps even all of it, on the work of those two philosophers. You'd then probably skip straight from Aristotle to modern philosophy, jumping over the medieval period entirely. Medieval philosophy has for a long time been the Cinderella of the subject's history. and We're talking now about a period of a thousand years or more, from the fall of the Roman Empire to the Renaissance. I think the chief reason for this is that throughout that period, virtually every important philosopher was an ecclesiastic, whereas in the century or two leading up to our own time, there's been a widespread reaction against religion, especially against its hold on thought. During that reaction, medieval philosophers came under suspicion of not pursuing the truth wherever it might lead, but of trying to find good reasons for what they believed already. Like most reactions, including healthy ones, this one went too far. The greatest medieval philosophers were true giants, doing genuine philosophy as we understand it today, and we can still learn a lot from them. As in the case of ancient philosophy, among the medieval philosophers there are also two figures who stand out from the rest, though in this case they're at almost opposite ends of the period from each other. St. Augustine was born in North Africa in the year 354 AD and died there in 430. Two of his books are still universally acknowledged as being among the world's great literature, The Confessions and The City of God. The other figure of comparable stature is Thomas Aquinas, who was born in Italy in the year 1225 and died there in 1274. He was a much more technical sort of philosopher than Augustine. His most famous works are two enormous compendia, one called Summa Contra Gentiles, which has been translated into English under the title On the Truth of the Catholic Faith, and the other Summa Theologiae, or Summary of Theology. The death of St. Augustine and the fall of the Roman Empire were followed by the period we call the Dark Ages. During those centuries, it was as much as the literate and learned in Western Europe could do to cling to the remnants of civilization. They saw their role as essentially preservative, and for a long time, scarcely any new intellectual work of lasting importance was done. During the 700 years from Augustine to Anselm, there was only one philosopher of the front rank. John the Scot, who lived in the 9th century. But once we get to Anselm in the 11th century, we embark on a steady flow of significant thinkers. Just a few of the names are Abelard in the 12th century, Roger Bacon and Thomas Aquinas in the 13th, then Duns Scotus, followed by William of Ockham, and then the medieval period itself is beginning to come to an end. To tell us a little about this long but unfamiliar and fascinating period in philosophy's history, I've invited the master of Balliol College, Oxford, Anthony Kenny, one of the few contemporary philosophers to have written extensively about medieval philosophy, and himself a former Roman Catholic priest. Anthony Kenny, before we start talking about specific issues or the work of individual philosophers, is there anything you'd like to add to that very brief sketch map of the period that I put forward just now? I'd agree with the, your choice of two philosophers to sum up the achievement of the Middle Ages, Augustine and Aquinas. But they're both very different people. Augustine is a, a solitary thinker, uh, somebody whose best-known work, as you said, is an autobiography, his Confessions, a book drawing enormously on his own meditation, his own reading of the Bible, his own interior life. Aquinas is very different. He lives, as you said, at a much later period. And Aquinas is not a solitary figure. He is somebody right in the middle of a religious and academic tradition. 
He's one of the great order of Dominican friars. He lived his life within communities of friars. He's also a university teacher. Uh, one of his great achievements was the production of these two magnificent university textbooks. That's what his great works are. They're essentially university textbooks. An enormous contrast with Augustine, who was such a lonely figure that at the end of his life when he was a bishop, he was the only man in the whole town who had any books at all. These, these are, in fact, two perennial types of the philosopher, aren't they? The lonely, isolated, introspective thinker and the institution man, the university teacher. You yes, as you go on in the history of philosophy, you find people falling into these two types. Uh, in the pattern of Augustine, you have the solitary geniuses like Descartes and Spinoza spinning their thought out of their own heads, as it were. You also have the learned university professors like Kant and Hegel uh, developing systems which were then to be handed on and modified to pupils and later generations of philosophers. Now, it's during the period that we're discussing, the Middle Ages, that universities were invented. And this very fact had a simply enormous influence on philosophy, didn't it, and the way it was taught, the way it was studied. Can you say a little bit about that? Yes, I think that is one of the most important contributions of the Middle Ages to philosophy, uh, is that it founded the university. By university, meaning a, a corporation of people uh, engaged professionally, full-time, uh, on the teaching of a corpus of knowledge, uh, handing it on to their pupils, having an agreed syllabus, having agreed methods of teaching, and having very high professional standards. It's a very remarkable thing how professional philosophy was in the Middle Ages. First of all, there's just the enormous output of the philosophers. Aquinas wrote, at about the lowest estimate, 8 million words. There are a number of other disputed works which might bring it up to 11 yeah. million. Yeah. Now, 8 million words is a lot to write. The whole of the surviving works of Aristotle are only a million works, words. The whole of the surviving works of Plato are only half a million. Aquinas, in quite a short lifetime, writes 8 million words. And they're not words just tossed off. They're words that scholars to this day can argue about the meaning of. So the output is enormous. The rigor is very great. Uh, Aquinas's works bear the stamp of the medieval technique of disputation. It was one of the great medieval methods of teaching. Uh, the teacher would put up two of his pupils, a senior and a junior one. Uh, the senior pupil would have to defend some particular thesis, for instance, that the world was not created in time, or for that matter, the world was created in time. The opposite thesis would have to be uh, presented and the main thesis attacked by one of the other pupils. The two would argue it out with each other. They had to argue according to strict logical rules, and then the teacher would settle the dispute, try to bring out what was true in what had been said by one, uh, what was wrong in the uh, criticisms made by the others. And if you open St. Thomas's Summa Theologiae, though it's not itself a record of, of live disputations, it bears the stamp of that. Whenever Aquinas is going to present a particular doctrine or philosophical thesis or theological thesis, he begins by presenting three of the strongest arguments he can think of against the truth of that thesis. A marvellous intellectual discipline. It prevents you from taking things for granted, makes you think, now, who have I got to convince of what and what are the strongest things they could say on the other side? That's, those are two of the things, the voluminous output, the rigorous method of presentation. Then there's the syllabus. Uh, a university syllabus uh, means that you have a lot of topics which anybody going to university is expected to learn, uh, a corpus of knowledge that they're expected to master, a state of the art which they have to reach, and then they add their own a little bit, their own little stone to the cairn of the scientific edifice and then hand it on to their pupils, uh, hopefully enhanced, but it must be preserved. Now, in the Middle Ages, the syllabus is set especially by the surviving works of Aristotle. Aristotle's works at the beginning of the High Middle Ages were translated into Latin. Very few of the great medieval philosophers could read Greek, but they had good translations of Aristotle, uh, and they worked a way to extract all the knowledge that it was possible to extract from Aristotle and then develop it. 